It's Thanksgiving Day Sunday, as I said. And I feel grateful. I feel thankful. But if you were listening to the scripture passages that were read this morning by Wendy, it would be pretty hard to find two more diametrically opposed passages of scripture in the Bible. Eh? On the one hand, from our reading in Job chapter 9, you find a person helpless in the midst of personal grief and anguish, angrily expressing their frustration for being in such circumstances. In the first reading, nothing, nada, nothing is good. And nothing is redeemable. There's just a big black hole where the pain and bitterness shape the, the entire horizon. And life, such as it is, isn't even worth living. This is what hopelessness looks like. To be sure, the picture is an extreme one, but I... I caution you against assuming that it is an uncommon state. For example, there are nearly two times as many suicides as there are homicides in the United States. A report on the leading causes of death in the USA for the year 2020 states the following. These are kind of revealing statistics. Suicide was the 12th leading cause of death overall in the United States in 2020, claiming the lives of over 45,900 people. Suicide was the second leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 10 and 14, and also between the ages of 25 and 34. The third leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 15 and 24, and the fourth leading cause of death among individuals between the ages 35 and 44. And here's a really, really interesting detail. If The detail is this. You are 50%, actually it's 53% more likely to commit suicide in Las Vegas than anywhere else in the United States. The land of glitz, Las Vegas, the entertainment capital of the world. Whoa. And Canada is not exempt from stats like these. On any given day in Canada, 10 people will end their lives by suicide. And up to 200 others will attempt to do so. For each death by suicide, the World Health Organization estimates 100 people are deeply affected. Today in Canada, 10 deaths by suicide will leave up to uh, or sorry, deaths by uh, suicide will leave up to 10 people in a state of bereavement, and beyond that, up to 100 additional people will also be deeply affected by that death. <laughs> so how come? How come? I mean, I mean, this is North America, the envy of the world where the good life is supposed to reign supreme. Something's not right. Something's not adding up. Now our other reading, it paints a, a completely different picture. Psalm 116 begins by saying that God has rescued the psalmist from trouble, verses 1 and 2. And then the psalm describes distressing circumstances now past in verse 3, and recalls a prayer for help in verse 4, along with the Lord's saving response in verses 5 to 11. That was all there. After which it then vows to give witness to God's salvation before the congregation, verses 12 to 19. And perhaps the most distinctive mark of this psalm is the promise of a thanksgiving offering. 
You find that in verse 17. In short, it's a psalm of thanksgiving. Whoa. What makes the difference? What makes the difference between these two extreme positions? What can bring us out of hopelessness and into thankfulness? What gets us from there to there? That's what I want to explore with you this morning. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest but turmoil, says Job, chapter 3, verse 26. Poor SpongeBob. Follow the arrow from there to there. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Psalm 116, verse 8. From there to there. And yes, I realize that these are two extreme positions and that most of us rarely find ourselves in a, a totally hopeless state wanting to die or in a euphoric state all of the time. Most of the time, we're kind of somewhere in between and hopefully skewed toward the more positive aspect of our lives. However, for our purposes this morning, I think it's useful to shape our thinking around the two extremes. In order to do that, I'm going to park mostly in the book of Job and for reasons that I hope will become apparent. Going off script just a little bit, bear with me, Tim. I wanted to preach this sermon for a while. Ever since I took a course in pastoral theology and one of the reference books that was given to us was a commentary on the book of Job by South American liberation theologist Gustavo Gutierrez. The title of his commentary is The Book of Job, God Talk and the Suffering of the Innocent. Remarkable, remarkable book. touched my life, touched my heart, gave me a new perspective, particularly on the book of Job, but on life in general. Now, if you know anything about the book of Job, this might seem like an odd choice for a passage for a Thanksgiving Day Sunday message. Most of the book of Job speaks to that extreme presenting us with a, a miserable man deep in suffering, longing for death, looking for an explanation of why God would allow a righteous man to suffer so horribly. Job's friends, who initially perform admirably and simply come and spend days sitting silently with him, listening to his complaints without trying to fix any, anything, eventually they lose their patience with him. They begin to insist that God would never cause such calamity to fall on an innocent man. Therefore, he must not be innocent. God himself acknowledged, but, sorry, sorry, he must not be innocent. But, but there is a problem. And there's a very big problem. Job was innocent. God himself acknowledged that Job was innocent. He says so in chapter 1, verse 8. Read with me. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless, innocent, and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. Whoa. So Job clings to his innocence in the face of his so-called friends, accu accusing, who are accusing him of all sorts of wrongdoing. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever suffered as deeply as Job. I haven't. And I'm not trying to solve the problem of pain and answer why God allows his people to suffer evil at all. That's not what I'm about this morning. They're good questions, and it's worth dialogue, but not this day. I can tell you that ever since the time of the early church fathers, the book's central character, the Job who suffers, but continues to believe at least, has been regarded as one of the great Old Testament pictures or types of the suffering Savior. And I think perhaps we'll come to an understanding of why that is as, as we observe together this morning. <clears throat> this is the Christ who continues to do the will of the Father, notwithstanding his own anguish in the face of certain death. What I want to focus on is thanksgiving or being thankful, if you will. But how in the world can we find reason to give thanks in the midst of Job's misery and confusion? In chapter 9, Job responds to his friend Bildad's argument that God, being a God of justice, will not, I quote, will not reject a man of integrity, and nor will he support evildoers. Unquote. Therefore, Job cannot be as innocent as he claims to be. And Job is willing to accept his friend's logic in light of God's powerful presence in the world. And he agrees that there is none like him, none like God, recognizing the degree of separation that there is between him and God. Let's just read a few verses in Job chapter 9. Verses 2 to 12. Bear with me. Listen. Indeed, I know that this is true. But how can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? Though they wished to dispute him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound, his power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes the pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion and Pleiades. In the constellations of the south, he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? <laughs> Joe's response is, who can defy God? And his answer Nada, nobody, no one. No one can bring a case or an accusation before the holy and powerful God. You know, there's a lot of praise here. There's a lot of acknowledging God's qualities. But there is no thanksgiving. In fact, it's the opposite. Job laments that God is this way because God actually seems to be his enemy. Ever felt like God was your enemy? You've been there. Off script again. Peter Schaffer wrote an absolutely remarkable play called Amadeus in the 1970s. It was made into a movie. Some of you may have seen it. It's where the... Uh, Composer Salieri, Italian composer Salieri, uh, becomes so envious of his counterpart Mozart's seemingly God given ability to create music that is beyond Salieri's space and comprehension 
that literally drives him insane. And he gets to the, and it's, it's a remarkable role to play on stage. It's one of the largest roles in all of English literature. <clears throat> I know this because I actually played the role. <clears throat> and the place you have to go in order to do that role is a, is a, is a, is a <clears throat> amazingly difficult place to be. There are lines in that play where Salieri says this, looking at Mozart and his abilities, and he says, Dio in giusto. That means you, you, God, are the enemy. I name thee now, Nemico eternal, eternal enemy. Suffering. Schaffer paints that picture for us to understand what it means to grind into the depths of hopefulness, hopelessness, rather. Job sees God as the enemy. He continues in verses 29 to 34. Since I am already found guilty, why should I struggle in vain? Even if I washed myself with soap and my hands with cleansing powder, you would plunge me into a slime pit so that even my clothes would dis detest me. He, isn't, he, God, is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there was someone to meditate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him. But as it now stands with me, I cannot. Yet Job clings to his innocence, which begs a very important question. Why? Why does he do that? Is Job wrong to continue holding on to his innocence? Should he not just admit his guilt and accept God's punishment? It's hot up here. I, I would submit to you that... Uh, Job is not wrong. Because to admit guilt would be based on two fallacies. The first is that Job is guilty. He's not. Job would be lying if he admitted guilt and came to God to repent. He has nothing to repent of. Now, this is not to say that Job is a sinless being. Don't hear that when I say these words. We know from the testimony of all of Scripture and personal experience as well, if we're honest, that, that no person is without sin outside of Jesus himself. However, Job's claim of innocence is correct based on God's description of him and that this current misery he has experienced isn't retributive payment for any particularly particular apparent sins. Job clings to innocence because he knows it to be, the, to be truthful in light of his understanding of justice. The truth is that in the context of the story, he has done nothing to deserve such harsh treatment. Hear me. This is the kind of innocence that victims of abuse in all of its forms must cling to. It's not their fault. This is the innocence of those who suffer from terrible disease and affliction. And they must cling to that, in, that, that innocence because it is not their fault. 
This is the innocence of those who, who are uh, victims of famine and extreme poverty. And they must cling to it because it's not their fault. The second false assumption is that God is the one who is inflicting these wounds and calamities. Who struck Job with these curses? If you know the story, it's Satan, not God. God in his sovereignty allowed Satan to go only so far in tormenting Job. God is not guilty of unjustly punishing Job. God has, in fact, spared his life from the full evil that Satan intended. That God spares his people from the full assaults of the devil is no small mercy, and it, it deserves unceasing praise. Things could be much worse. And God protects and God limits Satan's ability. But there's something, there is something at the tail end of those verses that is particularly profound and has great, great bearing on where we're going here. See, here. Job 9, 33 to 35, once again, read with me. If only there were someone to medi mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him. But as it now stands with me, I cannot. Essentially, Job recognized that it's not a fair fight, and he requires someone more capable than himself to present his case before God. Amazing. You now, it's absolutely paramount that we get this. In all of his anguish, complaint, and request for an end to his suffering through death, Job believes that somehow there is something or someone that can plead his case and make some sense of it all. Jumping all the way to chapter 16, verses 18 to 20, listen to what Job says. Earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out my tears to God. Even now in my witness, even now my witness is in heaven. Did you hear it? Written thousands of years before the birth of Jesus, the writer of Job record, records the requirement for an intercessor between man and God. Job will not agree to his case being closed. The dramatic cry, like the complaint in the preceding verses, gives rise to an expression of confidence in a mysterious mediator, someone who will defend his complaint before God. So Job's rhetoric takes a, a dramatic turn. The expressions of despair and anguish and complaint give way to a statement of faith. See here in chapter 19, once again, the language of hope. This is Job. I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. I know that my Redeemer lives. 
here. Here is where we find our thanksgiving. In the depths of Job's suffering, even at the deepest complaint of his heart, here we find cause for celebration. What is Job's deepest complaint? Look further into verse 32, verse 35 in chapter 9, that God is spirit, that God is holy, and separated from humanity. Job longs for a mediator between himself and God who could judge righteousness and wickedness with justice and with mercy. Now, I don't know what life has been like for you recently, whether it's been a time of laughter and fulfillment and excitement or a, a time of deep suffering and struggle, or, or maybe it's just somewhere in between. Maybe you've been so busy you haven't had time to slow down and even think about what life is like for you. I, I, I pray that, that you don't find yourself suffering as, keen, as keenly as Job did this Thanksgiving. I pray that you are not suffering in the depths of chronic depression on the verge of giving up. But if you are, please know that you are loved. That there is help here, in, in this place, where you can find compassion and grace. Because we here are called to mirror the life of our Savior. And that is who he is. Compassion and grace. It's been a tough year for Carol and me. It's been a season of loss and we've been witness to some pretty catastrophic events in our family. Yet we have been blessed with comfort and with compassion from this community of faith. And we're deeply thankful. We're very grateful. And I believe all of it finds its source in, in our mutual, unshaking conviction that we have a mediator and a redeemer in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what is this reason for thanksgiving? It's the gospel. It's the gospel in its completeness and it's in, in, in its entirety. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of Job's deepest longing. In part, it's the gospel of mediation. Oh, that one would mediate between me and God. Oh, that God were a man. Oh, that God would lift his wrath and spare me. Oh, that I did not fear God, says Job. Every one of Job's expressions of longing in verses 32 to 35 are fulfilled in the person and the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God became a man, says the Gospel of John, verse 14, chapter 1. The Word, meaning the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus did bring us to court through notice, though notice how the rules are reversed. Though Job asserts his innocence and God's guilt, Jesus actually asserts his innocence and man's guilt. Yet Jesus doesn't do this to condemn us or to prove his point. He does this so that he might take on our guilt and suffer instead of us. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, I quote, He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Chapter 5, verse 21. God saw fit to pour his full wrath on Jesus, to hold nothing back. Once that penalty was paid, the wages of sin that we deserved, but what Jesus absorbed on our behalf, all enmity between God and his people was lifted. 
As Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Paul's conclusion, we have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. In 1 John chapter 4, the beloved apostle puts it this way. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. 1 John 4 verse 18. Loved one, if you are in Christ, there is no fear. Jesus has become your mediator, our mediator. He has laid his hand on you, and he declares you innocent. He has removed all fear of condemnation and judgment from God. Remember that we learned of Christ's role as intercessor and high priest from our series in Hebrews. Just want to give you a f- just a few verses from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. I love this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Amen. No more fear. We draw near with confidence to the throne of grace and we receive mercy. In the face of unfathomable suffering, in the midst of discontentment or busyness, even in the midst of happiness and laughter, no matter how much or how little you have to be thankful for this Thanksgiving, no matter how short or how long your Thanksgiving list is, This news, this gospel news is the reason to give thanks. I don't know if the book of Job would be any shorter if Job had known that full gospel reality. His circumstances would still have been disastrous. His friends may still have been fickle. And as any Christian who endures long periods of suffering can attest to, one still cries out to the Lord with hard questions and bitter tears. But the gospel assures us that we call out to one who has drawn near, one who comes and sits in the sackcloth and ashes beside us, and one who promises to make all things right, And that makes all the difference. From there to there through the cross. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. From there to there. It's the cross. That's what gets us from there to there. Amen.